But the big reason I wanted to talk to you was that one, you're like a really approachable guy, like on oh, all your social you. media. Like it was. I always try to be. Yeah, and I think that's awesome because I think that a lot of times with you know, like that's one of the big reasons I really loved when uh, Dead Mouse did his streams back in the day because it was like right. that. It was that level of personability. I don't know that. Like behind the scenes 100%. kind of thing, yeah. you know. And, and that's, that's why I really fell in love with Joel's stuff too. I think, yeah, it was less because I, I mean, I love the music, but I think it was more because of the surrounding things around the music, like he, his, like you know, geeky mm-hmm. interests and stuff that I could relate to when I was like fifteen or sixteen, or like his live streams or like his approachability, like you said, that was what really made me fall in love. With, um, you know, the Dead Mouse Project. Yeah, and I think the big thing, too, that I think is really important with a lot of artists, like especially like electronic artists, is that yeah. it's it's like the way Joel approached marketing and like his whole sure. brand in general was just like every time I dug a little bit deeper into him, I just got more impressed, you know, like, oh, this is a neat song. Then you go in and be like, who made it? Oh, this dude from Canada. And then you look in and you're like, oh, he's also a graphic designer. And oh, yeah, he also did all of his own mixing and mastering. He, uh, you just figure out he does fucking everything, you know? And that's yeah. that's something that's really special to me, I think, because whenever I first started listening to electronic music, it was it was very, like... It's a very special thing to me because electronic music is so unique in the sense that, you know, if you really take advantage of being able to do a lot of your own sound design, a lot of your own mixing and do all these different Mm -hmm. creative choices, you can make this experience that's, you know, that that you can tune in so finely as opposed to other medias, I think. you, You aren't working with another, you know, producer or what Mm -hmm. have you. Which I think there's an art in it of itself. Oh, a hundred percent stuff too. Yeah, like like working in a creative team of people working on a single record is a totally different art form. But oh like, yeah, like you said, like when you when you're in electronic music, there's kind of this like expectation for you to do everything. Yeah, and by that proxy, you know, like you you come up with these like workflow things that really define like you, mm-hmm. like. You another engineer might not approach it the same way you approach it. And the combination of like how you do your mixing production and like you said, sound design really creates like that. Like this is my tonal fingerprint. This is my like sound. You know? Yeah, hundred percent. That's definitely pretty unique to electronic music for the musician to also have a hand in like the production. At least historically, mm-hmm. I don't know. Like going forward, now we have like a lot of bands and stuff that are doing it all themselves, but right. Historically it's always been like, you know, the musician and then the producer and then the engineer and then, you know, the, um, whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. and there's something I want to talk about with that, but first I'm going to ask a kind of leading question to that. And it's, you know, you come from originally doing a lot of the YouTube tutorial stuff and you got really well known for doing those, but yeah. um, to me, because I'm a very self-taught person, I'm just the kind of guy that opens up the DAW and I just right. fuck around until something happens. And then eventually I'll hit a problem and I'll be like, okay, well, I'm having this problem where every time I try to drive the snare, it just sounds like shit. And then you look into it, do a little bit of research and you do Google, okay, why does my snare sound like shit? And then you'll find, you'll, you'll eventually figure it out, you know? Yeah. Like you'll learn about different types of distortion. And you're like, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't use a fuzz pedal on my snare. And then, you know, you move on from there. But like, what are your favorite types of tutorials? Because for me, as a self taught person, it's like I hate it. Like, I was asking a lot of my people, like, what kind of tutorials would you like to see from me? And they're telling, saying things like, oh, how to side chain and like how to make yeah. your bass fat and stuff like that. I'm like, that's a really interesting <sighs> question. I've never gotten a question like that. I would say like my approach to tutorials and the tutorials that really helped me because I had a very similar, um, you know, path or course. Uh, mm-hmm. I was very hard headed and I wanted to teach myself everything instead of, you know, learning, you know, from others and 
Right. You know, it took me freaking 10 years to get anything good because of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, I think that the, that my favorite type of tutorials and the tutorials I try to create are tutorials that aren't, um, I don't want to say biased, but um, they don't kind of impose a uh, style or writing, you know, like or or mm-hmm. ideologies on the yeah. person. It's very it's very literal and it's very objective. Of like, okay, this is exactly what a makeup gain knob does. Yeah, more of like or a like definition is, type. Right, of- this is what a threshold does. It's not like you're going to turn this knob and then this knob and then this knob and it's going to sound like this. Doesn't this sound good? Like I hate yeah, those type that, of tutorials. No. Um, they, they don't date well either. Like if you look yeah, at also, some old massive tutorials, I'm like, woof. Right. I, that's, I would be yeah, shocked to hear it sound really, like that today. <laughs> yeah. And I also really don't like like pushing ideologies on people. Like yeah. you have to have this analog compressor for your, your, you know, summing to sound yeah. good or whatever. Like I'm just like, no, there's a lot of people that don't do that um, and get great results. It's really how you use the tool and it, your understanding of it, not the tool itself. I'm a fundamental believer in that. Yeah, and that's a, that's my my huge. like tool set. Yeah, my tool set's very limited. Yeah, because like, the stock shit pretty much, right? Exactly, Ableton yeah. stock almost everything, and um, I love know, I, Ableton stock plugins. Yeah, I outsourced my like limiting. I think there's mm-hmm. no good limiting solution in live. I, I think the um the reverb solutions in live are not good, so I use Valhalla yeah. DSP. But like for the most part, I think you can get away with using the uh built in stuff and get really good results. Yeah, and a lot of musicians do. Yeah, and you know, like I use FL and I've used FL since pretty much the beginning and I've fiddled around here and there. But um yeah. the main reason I use FL over anything right now is for two reasons. One is I'm broke, so I can't just go out and buy another DAW. And uh, <laughs> lifetime free updates is awesome. Um, that is awesome. I, I own FL Studio. I used to use it um, mm-hmm. when I was first getting started. Um, it's an interesting story. I, I started as a DJ actually, and I was doing. And you got FL. <laughs> so I was doing. I was doing Tractor first. No, I was doing Virtual DJ first, and I actually used oh, to do man. Virtual DJ tutorials on YouTube. I remember um, watching was, that because I remember the yeah. first time I, when your autonomous EP came out, yeah. I was like, God, this guy seems familiar. And I go back and I looked at yeah. that, and I watched that like oh, oh like oh yeah back a while ago. Sure. I'm like, oh, this is that. Yeah, guy. like I <laughs> I was in like middle school or something, and I made a tutorial for my friend to teach her how to DJ. <laughs> and um, it just went viral on YouTube. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll keep doing this. So I made like five of them. None of the other ones exist anymore. I deleted them. I just kept the original just, you know, as oh, wow. a memento to be there. Um, then I, that kind of transitioned into Tractor. Um, mm. And from there, Ableton Live. But in between that, um, I was working on music on like, I had this proprietary Behringer doll. I have this like story about that in another interview. I think I watched that one, yeah. Yeah, I had this old Behringer DAW from like a demo software my dad brought home because he he's into audio tech too. So, yeah, but like more traditional like you know tapes and what have you. Right. Uh, yeah. Multi tracks. So he brought this thing home to convert uh, analog stuff to digital. It's just like essentially a sound card, what we'd call it today. Right. Um, but it had this demo program on it, and I was writing music <laughs> on there for a while. Then I got my first Mac. I think it was a G5 Power Mac, which is crazy antiquated now. And that that was like um, when I got into GarageBand. Mm-hmm. I then got a uh, PC laptop, and I was using um, I was using uh, FL Studio for a very very brief moment. Yeah, and then and then I decided I hated that, so I went back to GarageBand, and then I went to Logic, and then to Ableton because. At the time, I was doing the tractor videos at the same time. And I was like, the next step is to learn like live performance. So I went to Ableton because Ableton's like yeah. a, uh, uh, you know, a performance tool. Yeah, too. I so love I, Ableton's I, workflow. It's so yeah, so it's so nice and well. When I together. picked up Ableton as like a DJ tool, then I then realized it's like, oh, this could be a DAW too. So then mm, I, yeah. I transitioned from Logic to that, and I haven't looked back since. I'm not yeah. really. The thing is, like, I, I like FL Studio. It's just kind of chaotic for me. It is. Um, the way I'd like to describe is, it to people is that 
Yeah. FL is great for experimenting and stuff like that because yeah. there's a million ways to do any one thing. Sure. And it you could route from all sorts of places to do the same thing. Um, yeah, I was gonna say like like it works for a lot of people. Like there's a lot of people that like have I know a uh, brain mindset. You know. Yeah, and you know I know like a more notable person being John Gooch. You know, feed meat spore. Yeah. He's he's used John's it since. Cool. He is he is an inspiration, man. That man's absolutely bonkers. I just yeah, he's great. Um, I would also say Porter Robinson and Mattyon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, those guys they're, too. They're my, <laughs> well, they're my biggest influences, so I would put them mm-hmm. as number one. John definitely uh, influenced me a lot when I was like younger, uh, mm-hmm. 2012, 2013. Right. Um, his stuff yeah, when FL he- Studios. Um, really powerful tool for getting ideas mm-hmm. down quickly but it's the workflow i can't get around um yeah it's very to, odd yeah and it works for some people and the people that really dial it in like there's an artist on my collective um called ghost data and he's yeah yeah incredibly good at he's amazing getting ideas down quickly in fl studio and mm-hmm. i can't even fathom that and then I, I have a opposite problem with logic like logic i feel like i'm in a box all the time and i'm I'm writing through like this this facade. Yeah, yeah. Like I, in a lot of Apple programs, I have that issue where, like, F, uh, Final Cut Pro, for example, if you're mm-hmm. in the video, yeah, 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 is like it's very much UI over function, right? Um, so it's like it's designed to be very pretty, um, and it's it is functional. Like, don't get me wrong, you do great oh, work yeah. in both of those programs, but it's like I feel um, almost like limited by the the interface. Whereas Ableton, mm-hmm. I think, is a compromise between the two of them, where it's it's very it's not pretty, but it's it's good looking enough and it's more straightforward than FL Studio. Listen, and it, I want to talk about ugly DAWs because FL. I'm sorry, but FL kind of looks like shit. Not gonna lie, I love I love Image Line. I love everything they do, but God, <laughs> when I'm trying to like that is color a, coordinate yeah. in FL, it, all the colors just look like. Garbage. That is I'm, a very controversial opinion because a lot of people like, adore the look of FL Studio. Listen, that's like their big thing about it. I know, like, because the big thing about FL is back in the day when it first came out, people were like, just like, oh, is this thing a toy? Right? So everybody had this complex about it. Like, you know, it had to be something that looked more professional, you know? But yeah. then other creative people were like, oh, it don't, it, it can be a toy. It can still make good music and all this kind of stuff. And that became a whole thing. So, like, I get it, but, like, man, I guess it might just be me. I don't know, but I hate yeah. I hate the colors in FL. I really do. Ableton, I'm however. I'm partial to it. I think Ableton is very clean. It's it is. It's very, like, in line with my design prowess. Like, yeah. I like that geometric vector-based mm-hmm. design. Yeah. Um, you can see that all over my brand. It, oh, yeah. But it, I, I think Ableton just... Fits for me, so I love mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Now, see, one I've been wanting to get into more was Bitwig because when I first heard mm-hmm. Bitwig coming out, I got like super excited because it has like the one thing that I really functionally don't like about FL is it's really hard to work with audio in it. Like sure. the way that you yeah. can in Ableton is a lot more simple. Like all the automation right. stuff is organized much cleaner. Um, in FL, you pretty much have to highlight and create automation clips for you know every little thing yeah, you do. Yeah, I'm pretty and, familiar with the workflow. Yeah, yeah. it's it's just kind of clunky when it comes to that. However, it has some of my favorite synths in it. That's fair. Yeah. Like Harmer, I use Harmer for a really long time because it's just I don't know if you have you ever really gotten into Harmer? I've I've messed with it a bit, but I, again, I'm not an FL guy, so yeah. it's never like a in my face. It's really interesting because it's technically written as an additive subtractive synthesizer, meaning mm-hmm. that it's adding in all of its adding in the harmonics individually as opposed to subtracting right. it from a more complex wave. It's sure. literally building yeah. it one sine wave at a time, um, which is really interesting because in that's it, really fascinating. In it, you have uh, you know when you open up Harmer, it just looks like a mess of knobs and dials but once you start getting into the settings you actually have control over pretty much every harmonic in it so if you load a sample into it and then you want to tune it do some weird stuff or do some cool like 
unison on I, it. I just, I don't think I would personally have a uh, functional use for that. No. <laughs> like in my music, like it's, my stuff's literally saw wave plucks. Yeah. Or like extended saw wave plucks but or like, they a, could, you it's know, pads. The, the crazy thing about that though is that, yeah. Um, like you could do so much with saw waves though. Like saw waves, I agree. you yeah. can you can do God knows what to that, and it'll still probably sound good. <laughs> like, there's there's so many like ways you can take a saw wave, and it's also very like everything you do with it sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> I, it's very rich harmonically, and and uh, you know you can pluck it. You can you can even do some FM like saw yeah. against a saw wave, and you get this really gnarly sound. Yeah, I love doing I know, my really favorite. Cool uh, my favorite thing to do in Serum is to just open up two basic shapes and just yep. start like messing with the FM between them. Oh man, that's literally me. Every sound I make is probably like five clicks away from like the initial <laughs> a, a default preset. patch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like it's it's basic shapes, um, minor filter envelope, you know, modulation, mm-hmm. some detune voices on the unison, and you know, reverb or distortion. I don't know. Yeah, but. That's kind of like my signature like tone anyway. It's more like synth wave, new wave Yeah, stuff. you know. I think. Yeah. And I think too, like it sounds like when I listen to No Mana, I get I get a lot yeah. of that too. Like his stuff has that similar like like his main synth sounds and stuff like that. Just sound like yeah. really simple, but they're processed well, you know, and that's mm-hmm. what takes it to that next step is that I get a lot of people sending me their tracks and I'm sitting here looking them over and they're like well what do i gotta do to it i'm like well just i don't know process yeah. it a little more just you know because there's a lot of like he has like a i think he uses a lot of different things like i know he does a lot of his stuff in serum mm-hmm. and i know he uses the operator a bit um but I, I i genuinely like i don't think he has like a go-to maybe i'm wrong because he, he does a little bit of modular stuff too so yeah. oh does he i didn't see i didn't yeah. know that just a bit yeah, but he has a pretty, pretty decent rack actually. Uh, I went to his place like a year ago. It could be bigger or smaller now, but you know. Yeah, I see. That's something I've always wanted to get into is modular. That's uh, I've just for me. I have like an unpopular opinion on that. I think it's 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 a cool idea in principle, and like I really enjoy the the culture behind it. I used to be into electrical engineering. Right, it was like going to be my thing in school. So I, I adore that. I adore building the stuff, but I just don't see the function in my music. Um, right. Like I find that oftentimes a lot of people in the modular community will spend, you know, five hours working on like a little, a, a small tone that is unusable in songwriting. And if you do use it, it's going to be like manipulated in a way that it, it's, it could. Yeah. Be or be so far in the from, background. Like, sample. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas, like your your main your main core elements of your track are gonna be, you know, either like a software synth or like a keyboard synth or like an all in one mm-hmm. synth, like a mode. <clears throat> yeah. Um, where you don't have to patch your your uh, your oscillator to your filter to your amp to your you know envelope generator like you don't have to yeah. have 30 cables to get a plot you know <laughs> so so like that's where i see modular for me it's like it's a experimental sound design tool you can mm-hmm. make cool sounds with it but ultimately that's what it is it's not like a functional day-to-day synth like a lot of people think it is in no. my opinion yeah no 100 percent. yeah and if i was to I, and i've considered starting a rack because i i do have some stuff that's com- compatible with your rec standard like i have a um a uh, maleco manther i have Ooh. a sq1 from korg the, the sequencer and yeah. it's all it's all compatible with like the same control voltage stuff but it's like i if i was to do it i would buy a like a model d or something like as the center of it and then the modules i would buy would be like effects i wouldn't buy like an envelope generator an lfo or something like that because i feel yeah. like you already cover those bases with, you know. Yeah, like mode. to me in my head, what I would what I would honestly love to do is I would love to just yeah. have uh, whatever sense I have, but then just have a bunch of like guitar pedals to just right. route them through. Because 
For one, you like, there's some really... With, yeah. You have to be wary with guitar pedals. That are, they're generally mono. Mm-hmm. So if you want to maintain your stereo integrity, you have to specifically buy stereo guitar pedal. That's the only yeah. thing about that. Yeah. Yeah, or you could try to just re- record everything over two, three, four times and yeah, hand I them around, I guess. And, right, yeah. But like, you I'm, would avoid I, phase that way. Yeah. Because yeah. I think the biggest thing right now is that, like, I think, you know, because I got the uh, CVC rack, the or the VCV. VCV rack, yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm, I I'm trying to mess all. with that, but. God, if I because I've always been a software guy, I've never really messed with sure. hardware m- much at all. So people are asking me, they're like, "Hey, have you checked this out?" I'm like, "Yeah, well, no, but I'll try." And I've been, I've been in like so many arguments on like Twitter and Facebook based on <laughs> analog versus digital synths, and like people don't understand. That I literally grew up on analog synths. Like my dad mm-hmm. is a engineer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we have like we have like a you know freaking ms10 still set up in his house like we play it all the time and it's it's not that i don't like analog it's just that i feel like there's better solutions it's now. just not necessary faster solutions now right um gra- i mean granted like there is a certain tonal quality and there's a certain thing about touching your synths which is cool yeah and i think that's and more I, of a workflow like thing you know like if you right, but i yeah yeah i just feel like if you like just do whatever gets you back into the studio the next day, you know? Right. And if, if for some people that's messing with the knobs for hours, making bleeps and bloops, and then eventually making a track out of something, or if yeah, that's and just hopping into like, the DAW. And it really depends genre to genre, too. Like, for me, like I'm saying, it's it's not really applicable. I, I can't foresee me using, like, these little micro bleeps from a, you know, modular array. Mm-hmm. micro samples that I grabbed from this giant recording. Um, yeah. <laughs> whereas I see someone like Mr. Bill or like Eprom, that's like their bread and butter. So like I, it, it's a very subjective thing, you know? Yeah. A hundred percent. That's just my opinion on it. Mm-hmm. Now uh, I, I, for the record, I have no qualms with analog and <laughs> cool culture. It's a cool culture and it's, there's definitely a cool sound to it, but it's, yeah, and I guess yeah. from a audio, and you know, like I guess the other thing about it too is that you know if people talk about the fidelity and things that you lose, but yeah. the problem is is that once you put it into your computer, once you get that sample recorded, right. it's well, my, it's a yeah, file. Like now. my rebuttal to that is like, are you going to record the sample at like 196k and then right. export it in like FLAC? No, yeah. <laughs> you're going to record it at 44. 44- 44 one maybe 48 or 96 and then you're going to export it at an mp3 quality that everyone's going to normalize on the platforms anyway like there's no actual sonic difference after no. once once you get through like the four layers of like essentially down sampling mm-hmm. um you know it's going to be a digital sound anyway there you can tell it's analog even after that but it's like the differences are so minute that it's to say that you can hear the fidelity difference mm-hmm. is like, I think it's pretty ridiculous. Yeah. On a kind of similar topic, um, something that I think about a lot whenever I'm working on tracks is the details that you add in a song that you think that there's probably no one's ever going to notice this, that I'm, sure. that I'm putting in the effort to do this little part. You know, like I get a lot of people saying things like, is it okay to use presets? Is it okay to use X, Y, and Z if I didn't put the right. effort into it? And I don't know. In the beginning, when I first started producing, at least, I always just thought that sound design was so special that I wanted to be able to say, like, I know how I made that sound, you know, whenever I show somebody my track, you know? I don't want to say, yeah. like, they're like, oh, man, how'd you make that cool sound? And I'm like, oh, well, I got it from a cymatics pack, you know? Like... And nothing against cymatics. I love right, their samples. Right. But the thing is, is just like for me and my pride as a producer, I suppose it is that it's yeah. just special to be able to be like, yeah, I made this and I know how to. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I remember there was this uh, arguing about this. I think laid back Luke said something about it. And he's like, 
you should always start with presets and then grow from there. Yeah. I, another like major Twitter argument I've been in is based on that. Cause I actually support that idea. I yeah. think, I think if you can make a track that sounds good with presets, you're like the past 50 years of musicians, you know, like <laughs> all of the biggest hits that are written are written on like these synths with, you know, 10 sounds, you know, or at least in the eighties yeah. and nineties, you know? So like, I don't think, and, and then you can even look past that to like, you know, piano or like, yeah, like what's an orchestra like that do? A pre- that is literally a preset. Uh, yeah. It's just, a, you know, a different way of looking at it. So to me, it's, it's whatever the end product conveys and the story that it conveys or like the emotion that you can convey through your music. It's not, I'm not a very technical, well, I, I'm not going to say I'm technically inept because I know what I'm doing. Right. But I'm, I'm not, I don't value that when I listen to music. I'm not yeah. actively thinking like, how did, well, I say that, but then I like, listen to music <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. But, right. but like gen- <laughs> generally I, I, I value like songwriting and like musicality mm-hmm. more than I value yes. like, how did he make that preset? Because I, I, I'm listening to the entire thing as a whole. Yeah. Right. And I think that's a huge thing for me because like, I don't, I don't even listen to a lot of electronic music by itself anymore these days. Same. I'm yeah. listening to like, I love, uh, I love like J pop music from like, cool. like the early nineties and early late nineties yeah. and things like that. Like mm-hmm. because of the songwriting, right? Because right. I think that, you know, a lot of these, cause you know, I'm a fucking anime nerd. We, Fuck. Yeah. Anyway, so it's like. Cool, me too. Awesome. Uh, (laughs) And, um, like, one band I always think of is Claris. Claris is amazing. Like, it it blows my mind because, like, it's hysterical because half the shows that they put their songs onto are absolute garbage. Like, like. God and then uh I love Oh Claris. yeah the uh irony song Yes I found a, I found an acapella for that and I was going to make Oh my god I just haven't done it Polo Porter uh, Robinson Did he do that? I think he did. I think he has an oh, old man. like from 2011 a uh, Well I guess I can't do irony it. Now, but, <laughs> but yeah no Um no, that's anyway. a, that's an awesome song cuz I love to I use I love to think of reference tracks when I sit down to write, sure. and a lot of times what I'm pulling is like structural elements and yeah. like not always chord progressions, but maybe like the movement or the vibe of it, you know. So I was like, gonna say, um, it, I don't know if you're familiar, but uh, there's generally common chord progressions for every style of music and Mm -hmm. Japanese pop and Japanese anything practically has this very defined chord progression. That's why some music, it could be like a video game song or like a, a pop song or like a classical piano piece. Um, They all have this inherent Japanese tone quality. It's because of this chord progression. And it's worth looking into if you're into uh, Japanese. I think music. so. Uh, now, listen, I have, I'm pulling it up right now. I have a document full of uh, chord progressions right yeah. here. Well, there's this one specific chord progression that like 80% of Japanese music use. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's like if you use that progression, it's going to sound like that. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's going to have that Japanese tone. Like everything from like Legend of Zelda to Claris uh, to like Radwimps are using that tone or mm-hmm. that progression inuyasha or like or like um you know princess mononoke yeah i think They're it has all, something to do with the three yeah. and the there's this really interesting seven, modulation yep yeah, exactly and yeah. and it makes it have this inherent japanese tone um i would definitely look into it I, yeah i think i saw a youtube video on it and it's very eye-opening oh yeah because i think of i don't remember that guy's name but um, I was looking into all sorts of co- chord progressions, and in one yeah. um, Clara song, the one for Puella Magica, uh, Connect. Sure. Um, okay. The da na 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 da na na da 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 da, like that one. Yeah. Um, it's called the progression, and that one's called the Royal Road progression, and it's a it's an old disco progression, and it's a yeah. it's a 
major four, major five, minor three, minor six. And it's really funny because it's also the same. It's that same progression is used in uh, Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up. So, of course, of course, there are plenty of uh, remixes done on that. But um, I think it's just interesting when people are experimenting with chords. And, you know, I've done a lot of music theory stuff over the course of learning because I just like to learn little facts as I go along. Um, And the thing that I've learned is that you can... People will try to constantly make new chord progressions, but honestly, right. I think for a lot of people, just starting with an established one and then working I from agree. there is yeah. the best way and to I, go. I, I do think that the best musicians, um, or at least what we perceive as the best, um, have this either like conscious or subconscious understanding of chord progression. Mm-hmm. Like You might not know what this is called, but you know this progression. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, same for like harmony and and identifying like a fifth. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of people that can harmonize with the vocal naturally are really good songwriters because they understand how melody works. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, yeah, I think that comes from just listening to a lot of chord progressions because generally, if you listen to a lot of music of a similar style, they're gonna have crossover chord progressions like. There, it's staggering how little chord progressions we actually use in pop music. Yeah, um, and then you can you know utilize those chords that you know people find nostalgic or like engage with um, in very unique ways and um, order. Like Porter Robinson and Maddie on our kings of that. Everything oh, yeah. they do is like is like a C major song, but every song has this really nice like nostalgic tone, but it feels new and fresh. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Because there's a lot of things you could do to a chord progression to just make it yeah. nice and usable. In a like adding way. a seventh or a suspended four. Or yeah, something extensions. Really changes. Just adding extensions. Right. Is an easy right. way. And then inversions, flipping them up but and down. But starting, around. right, exactly. But starting with that, you know, core understanding of like one, five, six, four or something, mm-hmm. you know, like understanding that this progression works um, is really yeah. important. Because a lot of people that don't, you know, end up with these wonky chord progressions that don't make sense in the song. Yeah, and I think that um, speaks on a lot yeah. of levels of a whole bunch of things to do with electronic music production. So I think 100%. that's a huge thing about starting with presets. Because if you start yeah. trying to do sound design from scratch, like I did, you're going to have a hard fucking time. Because what ends up happening is I'll just start making sounds that I think sound cool, and then you slowly learn that you need to make them usable, you know? So it's right. nice to have in your mind what usable sounds sound like, you know? Yeah, and the other thing I think about electronic music all the time is, like, people, because you have unlimited or, like, perception of unlimited freedom um, in your DAW, like, you can, you know, add as many tracks as your computer can run. You tend to overwrite. You, like, add yes. too many things. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas I like to think of my music like I would think of, like, a rock band or, like, a orchestra where... Um, every instrument has their place in like the sonic spectrum or like they're all yeah. placed within like certain octaves of one another. I don't layer like five different bases because it wouldn't make sense in a rock band. Right. It wouldn't make sense in like a, it wouldn't make sense in a band to have like two or three lead guitarists playing at one time. And I like to approach my music in that way. Yeah. Or as Mr. Bill would say, low stuff does low stuff and mid stuff does mid stuff. <laughs> yeah you don't want to have like five things in the c2 octave because then it's just going to be a cluttered mess there yeah um i i try to <laughs> approach like i think dead mess is a similar approach i I, mm-hmm. I don't know exactly but i think subconsciously he does um i like to place an instrument in every octave and i don't like to put more than one instrument in an octave mm-hmm. um it's like a julian gray pro tip in every song i have <laughs> is like that. Like there's only one element in each octave. Um, Avaricia is a really good example of that. Okay. There's, there's only one sound in each octave. Um, short of like ambiences and, and drums, of course, that are like not yeah, octaves. Yeah, atonal specific. sounds. Sure. Yeah. Um, I like to do that. And I think Joel does too. 
Um, yeah. At least in my like perception of what he does, I don't know his exact project files, but that's like how I approach writing music. I like, I start with a chord progression, like just, you know, a basic triad. And then I drop the root note an octave and then down two octaves for a sub. And then I'll take the, the fifth up like an octave from where the triad was. And then that will be like the start of the lead. So mm-hmm. I'll never have like, I'll never have like chords and like, or I never have more instruments playing that chord, the same chord. Yeah. And another thing that, and I do some, I, I kind of work in a very similar way where I'll have elements in the mix that are supposed to be, f- that are meant for a particular range or a spot in the frequency range. So that whenever right. I'm like referencing my mix to try and make sure all my levels are right, and I see there's a dip at, you know, 5K or something like that, then I go to whatever instrument that is and just, turn it up and you immediately know to turn it up right because yeah. and you don't need to eq not, or anything like that. right and there's like you know like um my method to eqing is a direct result of that because when you have a, an instrument with a fundamental frequency let's just say like i don't know the exact numbers but let's yeah if your if your c1 is at 500 hertz and your c2 is at uh a thousand hertz um again i don't know if that's exact um your Instrument at C2 and C1 will literally never compete because the root note is going to be 500 hertz apart. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, like, like my idea of EQ is literally to take that 1,000 hertz and just roll off anything below 1,000 hertz. Yeah. <laughs> and then I don't, I, don't do, I don't believe or do surgical EQ in any of my stuff. The closest thing I'll do to that is, like, a sharp resonance peak to get the tone of a resonance. Um, Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, well, it's like a of like super hyper resonant tone. I, yeah. I do that, but I will never do surgical EQ. I'm not going to pull out 1000 hertz because it's quote unquote ringing and like the, another layer and they're masking each other. I don't do that. Yeah. I, I write my stuff so that it's inherently mixable. I don't like to try to fix my writing in the mixing stage. Yeah. And I think. And that's that's a really interesting thing too because yeah. you know I think that for a lot of people it's really easy to just they'll be working on a synth or whatever and then sure. they make this synth like say they want that huge festival sounding synth but then yeah. they start their first sound as like max range as possible so they'll make this huge super saw that's just they're doing everything to this Spans one saw three octaves. Yeah, yeah and it's just right. like this huge thing I'm like whoa boy calm down uh, cause I've seen what a lot of people have been doing that I've been seeing more lately is that instead of doing like a little triad chord stack with the same synth, they'll do mm-hmm. a separate synth for each note. So like, say you had a C major chord, you'd have one synth for C, one synth for E yeah. and one synth for G. And then if you have extensions, kind of the same thing. Right? I actually and, do. I do a similar thing. Um, but I will have that triad playing at like one of the neutral, like octaves, like c1 or something yeah and then i'll split i'll split the fifth like the top of the triad up an <clears> octave <throat> for a different instrument and i'll mm. split the root down an octave for the bass oh, it's just spreading out that chord so there's a lot of space between yep yeah, yeah. and I, I think i think um your like when you have like chord stabs or whatever like you know electro kind of stuff you want every single stab to be a note of the chord you don't want to ever have a note that's not part of the chord that is that chord of the progression Mm -hmm. um hard to explain without showing yeah Yeah. it's kind of an odd thing to just (laughs) talk about how something sounds (laughs) sure yeah we're kind of just rambling about it (laughs) (laughs) but but uh, it's gonna follow that but you know whatever mm -hmm. but um so um i was I was looking through trying to figure out some good things to talk about. And one thing that I stumbled on um, mm-hmm. that I thought would be interesting is um, what do you, what do you listen to to, or what do you do that inspires yeah. you to make music? Cause for me, it's a lot of different things. And I know for a lot of people, it's a lot of different things. It's not just, you know, like listening to dead mouse and you're like, okay, I'm yeah, ready to I'm make dead mouse that now. Is- Right, like two different questions because I listen to a lot of, I listen to a lot of different things. Um, mm-hmm. 
lots of jazz, lots of uh, alternative. Um, I'm really into like this upcoming like female rap pop kind of stuff, like Japanese breakfast and Japanese oh, house yeah. and those kind of artists like um, Hundred Waters, etc. Um, I'm really into that sort of stuff. I'm into like. Oh, uh, I don't know. Jazz, classic rock. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't get a lot of inspiration from electronic music. I find it really like boring yeah. to listen to. I think that um, there's just I, specific artists for electronic music yeah, that I really listen to these for days. For me, it either has to be A, a really good um, songwriting. Like mm-hmm. the, 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 the song has to be good. Um, not the track, but the actual song itself. Right. Um, where I relate to it or like, it's very clever. Um, or the production has to be unique and cool. Like, um, again, like hundred waters is a nice take on that kind of alternative mm. electronic music. Um, otherwise it's just like very bland to me. I, I'm not super into it. I, I, I get like, I, I do. I, I will say that I listen to and I keep tabs on what's popular and what, right. And and I do enjoy like you know a banger song every now and then like Skrillex's newest EP was oh my uh, god sick wow um, <laughs> but but like I it's it's generally short of a few artists I'm not really impressed by the genre yeah um, listening at least I, I I like to incorporate ideas of other genres and you know stuff like that into my stuff I don't like to stay within that realm. Mm-hmm. And then as far as inspiration goes, it could be anything like my day-to-day life, my traveling, um, creating other stuff, you know, other yeah. musicians that I know or other artists that I know. Cause I, I hang around a lot of creative people mm-hmm. and, um, it's always inspiring. Yeah. And I think, uh, cause one thing for me is I've always been the kind of guy that I've always loved just learning all sorts of different things. So a lot of times for me, what will inspire me to do something will be I'll learn either one particular little fact about how somebody made something at some point in time, or um, I'll learn something about a process. Like earlier today, I was looking through, looking at uh, audio system measurements and I was looking at, because there's apparently some sort of standardized, well, it's not technically standardized, but it's a, particular way of measuring the fidelity uh, huh. of a song in a bunch of different ways. Like there's, you know, it talks about frequency response. Like does it incorporate more or less frequencies? You know, like if you had like a sure. really simple song that was just like a piano and like a hi hat, you know, like a simple little bossa nova thing, then technically they would measure that lower because it doesn't encompass more frequencies. Um, Interesting. Yeah, but then the other thing I learned, which I thought was really cool, and I've never heard of this, but so there's yeah. technically like two types of dis- of uh, distortion, and okay. ones that create even harmonics and ones that create odd harmonics, and okay, I didn't see. I, I had never even heard of that. I'm just like, oh, distortion makes things sound boom, you know? Like I didn't. Right. I never right. really right. thought of it that much. But yeah, um, my understanding of distortion is pretty slim. Yeah, but apparently. When you hear things that are like warm, like when people describe it as warm type of sounds, they're more often than not going to be even harmonics that are being added through the distortion. Um, just, right. you know, that makes sense, you know, because it's like yeah. pretty much octaves, right? Um, like right. 100 hertz, 200, then 400, and so on. Um, but then the odd harmonics are the things like the uh, like diode. And, you know, the asymmetrical types of distortion or the sure. transifiers or whatever, the, whatever they're called. Um, yeah. And things like that inspire me because um, I'm like, ooh, well, now I have to mess with all the different types of distortion, make a weird track that switches between them. Like, that's just how I think. Um, yeah. But something I wanted to ask, talk to you about, <clears throat> something that is based on one of your more recent videos you did about trying to stay away from being a genre artist, because that's it. That's huge for me because I think I think, and I think a lot of people struggle with that coming up as a small artist now, because 
they have this thought in their head like they have to be a particular brand or be so specific and be so right. specific to like some rules or regulations on how to write a song as opposed to going for like a vibe or like a mood of some sort, you know, like people will come up and be like, all right, well, I'm a electro dubstep artist or, sure. and that limits you because now you're saying, well, I can't make anything that's not a loud club banger pretty much, you know? Right. And I think, I think like when you look, I mentioned in the video, like when you mm-hmm. look at the most prolific artists of the past, decade especially in electronic music but else, elsewhere as well they don't have any regard for genre like yeah i think you I mentioned i li- i can't imagine uh skrillex saying like i'm a dubstep artist you know i i right. can't see that i th- i think he sees himself as a musician and like this is cool i want to write that or same yeah. with dead mouse like i i i think he identifies as a progressive house artist basically because people call him that but yeah. I don't think that he really identifies with it. No. Um, you know, so I think I think finding like uh, a sound per se, like this sounds like Porter Robinson, this sounds like Dead Mouse, this sounds like Skrillex, um, is more important than, you know, every song of yours sounding exactly the same. Because people, and the, the wider audience doesn't understand genre anyway. Right. Like the majority of people are just like, oh, this is a good song. Um, Mm -hmm. It could be whatever tempo you want. That's such a EDM thing. Yeah. Um, Tempo. Like like (laughs) when you listen to when you. Yeah, exactly. When you listen to like hip hop or like pop, even rock, it's varied in tempo. It's varied Mm -hmm. in, um, you know, syncopation. And it's you know, still sounds like the band or artist and people Mm. like the wide majority of people get that. Like they don't, they don't care about the tempo of the song. They like the song. They like the song. Um, And if you play the song, even if your set is 128 BPM, if you play a song at 150 and it sounds like you and, and people like the song, they're going to like the song. It's not going to matter. So that's my whole philosophy on it. And I think that, abandoning that idea of genres um, makes you into more of like a musician mm-hmm. than like a banger artist that's just trying to, you know, stay within a lane. Yeah. Cause you, you, there's a lot of artists. I'm not going to say any names that are like, you know, really big in like, let's say like tech house or like mm-hmm. bass house or whatever. And when the genre falters, then that artist is going to falter. Yeah. It's like they're riding the wave with the genre right Right. whereas if you can transcend that and establish a sound um you you don't have to worry about that because you're you're just creating stuff that you enjoy it doesn't it is yeah and granted i mean if you if you love making house music and that's all you want to make that's fine oh yeah and i know there's a lot of people like that like people i know a guy that just makes all he makes is you know like that Early nineties, late eighties, uh, yeah. you know, acid rave, right? Psytrance, you know. My thing is more so like, do whatever you feel is right, and mm-hmm. um, don't limit yourself to that genre based on other people's expectations because those expectations are actually false. They don't exist. Um, you just <laughs> think they do. I think. Yeah, I think that's totally and true. It, yeah. Because, you know, at least I mean, like, at least in outside of the electronic music realm and obviously there's or inside of the electronic music realm, rather. And 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 there's definitely like a threshold to that. Like if you're going from. Really hard, like heavy music to like ambient lo fi. (laughs) Yeah. You're, it's going to be a really hard transition for your audience because that's not like a genre change. That's like a feel change. Mm-hmm. And that's what you have to avoid necessarily. Yeah. Like if it feels the same, like if, if you can convey the same feeling or the same kind of sound with whatever genre you're doing, that's fine. But if you totally like change tone, then then it's weird. Yeah. And see, that's been my biggest problem for like the past five years is that Um, I'll be sitting here working on like whatever I'm working on. And typically, you know, I kind of 
I kind of, as far as the main electronic stuff I do, is mostly kind of like experimental, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes more riffy electro type of stuff. Sure. Um, but every once in a while, I'm like, okay, I got to get my songwriting kick out of me. So I'll go through and write like these jazzy, happy, like bossa nova right. songs. And like, so <laughs> my problem right now, which I need to fix is when you go to my my pages, you're getting two completely different vibes at you at the same time. You're getting this For weird, sure. dark, yeah. industrial, experimental stuff, and then you're getting, like, happy elevator music. Which <laughs> yeah, which, I, I, I'm in, like, a kind of similar boat, but I'm, I always try, like, my stuff, I think the big identifier is the melodic content, mm-hmm. like the the counterpoint melody and harmony and um you know the chord progressions are very me yeah Uh, but i i definitely empathize with that in that i write techno and then i write like trance yeah (laughs) Um, and they're very different but i think what ties it together for me is like my breakdown melodies and like the counter melodies that i use throughout the songs like granted it is kind of jarring going from like let's say like my Eddie remix to like old outside. <laughs> yeah. But but you know, I think I don't know. I'm 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 working on that. I'm I'm trying to establish like a tone that's me. And I think I, I have I don't know, man, because know. here's here's my thought when I listen to your music, all right? And this is just my thought. Um yeah. when I listen to your music, it reminds me a lot of kind of it gives me a similar vibe to older Dead Mouse stuff in that okay. it's like it has a core a core part of it that is a part of the entire song. So for you that's like the melodic and chord progression content, right. but then it has its a lot of times you have a very similar structure in the sense that it's like, you know, you have your melodic parts that are supposed to be the melody and chords are like the focus and then you have your yeah. more like riffy electronic parts that are like right more root note more you know melodic parts yeah, spit 100%. in but like i if, from when i listen to your stuff i get like that kind of quirkiness you know like it's kind of silly in yeah. a way that's like definitely it's like you're just you know doing whatever you want to do like it sounds like like when i listen to your stuff especially autonomous um, yeah, that whole EP is very um, experimenti- experimentative. Yeah, like I, I, I wrote that as like kind of to stretch my musical legs. I wanted to mm-hmm. create the most complicated thing I could, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think my melodies and stuff do have this quirkiness to them. Yeah, for sure. No, I definitely get that vibe, but um. Yeah, because I think that um, now I'm working with a lot of, um, well, I say a lot. It's a lot for me, but um, I'm working with some smaller artists and we're all yeah. just kind of like, you know, we're all just sort of like support walls for each other. So everybody's right. working on like EPs and things like that. And, you know, none of us have a budget, but, you know, it's more of a, uh, you know, you're working on something Let's send it to everybody and see what everybody thinks and, right. you know, help everybody out. It's like, oh, you need art. Well, I got a buddy. Let's get you some art. That kind of a That's thing. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think, too, I, I've i always been a hermit when it comes to music production because yeah. I had a lot of really bad experiences early on with okay. people just not being interested in what I, my music at all, what I'm doing. And nobody right. could give me good feedback, right? Like I couldn't tell from anybody when I was first making music, if anything sounded like something that they would actually listen to, you know? So then I would go online and that's when everything fell apart because you go online to ask for feedback from other producers. And that's just a shit show because of course everybody, because the way a lot of people give feedback and I noticed this a lot more whenever I got more into discord is that, you go to like the self or the critiques tab and X, Y, or Z discord channel. And then you put in your track 
and then you're getting all sorts of different kind of feedback, but none of it is really objective. It's more like, this is bad because you don't do that in EDM, you know, kind of thing. Like, you'll get a guy that only makes, like, electro giving your critiques on your drum and bass song, you know? Sure. And it's like, I think that a lot of people going along with that genre, single genre mindset are... They really have a very closed perspective on how to grade quality of things outside of themselves. I think, at least, hundred percent, yeah. Because, and that's why I made the Discord is because mm-hmm. I was like, God, I'm tired of just getting really shitty feedback. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get some nice people together, and we're all that's just gonna like hang out there. Why I, <laughs> yeah, it's why I created, you know, my YouTube community on Facebook mm-hmm. and Discord. Like, it's I try to keep it positive in there and actually yeah. constructive. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny. You should say like, you have this like group of people um, that you kind of bounce ideas off of like a friends group. Cause I, I'd say like three or four years ago, uh, me and several other massive artists uh, that are, that are like much bigger now. Um, not to say I'm a massive artist, but I'm saying like some bigger artists. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we basically, got together in this Facebook group chat um, based on our mutual interest in dead mouse. Yeah. And we would send ideas back and forth and like get feedback. And we have this mutual goal of being on mousetrap. Yeah. And it's crazy. Cause now I think out of like the 10 people in that group, like eight of us are on mouse. That's crazy. So, to like, think about we, we have this like power group that we've, we've, you know, worked on, each other for Mm -hmm. like the past four years or whatever. We constantly improving each other's work and we all have like crazy cool accolades now, like monster cat and astral works and yeah, you know, mousetrap or whatever. And I think, I think the value of having like a small group of people that are like-minded and have similar goals um, is definitely there. I think that's one of the most important things to have. Yeah. I think that I don't know that I would be there if without them. Yeah, no, I think, you know, the people you're around and that you allow to influence you are yeah. going to be the biggest effect on where you go. Because, I mean, yeah. I'm, you know, I don't, I'm not, you know, big on, you know, anything really, because I've pretty much only been promoting myself at all in the past, like, two years, maybe. Even that's yeah. just uploading stuff. And it's not, you know, promotion or sending demos or anything like that. I can't remember the last time I sent a demo somewhere, but um, the uh, it's it's really it's a really powerful thing to be able to go to your crew and yeah. see them grow with you, you know, because I've been out of the people that I work with, like I have buddy Luke and uh, okay. I've been working with I knew him back when I was in high school and you know, I've known him for maybe like uh, six, seven years now. And I taught, yeah. I was the one that taught him how to make music pretty much whenever he first got started. You know, he was like, right. man, I want to make this awesome drum and bass because he was always a huge drum and bass guy and still yeah. is. And he was like, I just, you know, he'd been messing around on his own. But by the time he had approached me, I had already been doing it for maybe, I don't know, a couple of years. And I kind of, had my wits about me as about, you know, how to do different genres and things like that. Um, So I was able to sit down, help him out. And now he's taken that and he's gone, you know, his own little direction. He, he makes awesome stuff now that I'm like, holy shit, I would have never (laughs) have thought of doing stuff like that, you know, but because I had the chance to share that knowledge, you know, I think that's, I think that's the biggest thing about it is because I think, and I, yeah, I have a similar uh, feeling towards my students. Like one of the most humbling and gratifying things in music for me is not just like the actual solo artist stuff. I actually really get more profound, like um, uh, I guess, uh, fulfillment from teaching and you know guiding these new musicians to places they want to be and watching them grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think, you know, it's it's a very interesting thing, I think, 
yeah. you know, because I think that a lot of people, especially, you know, smaller artists, they have this huge grandiose idea about what their favorite artists do. And I think sure. a lot of times they kind of overestimate. Absolutely. And, you know, I think like, that, you know, like whenever yeah. I first watched Dead Mouse's Masterclass, I was like, holy crap, right. you know, because it's like he's it's very straightforward. It's not this complicated thing that you've established in your head. He's just done no. all the steps right. You know, he's asked himself the exactly. right questions yeah. and he got the result he wanted. So I think that a lot right. of people struggle because they're not asking themselves the right questions when they're working. They sit down, they're like, I think the biggest thing is when they first open the DAW, they're like, what do I want to make? And that's when the first mistakes start to happen. You know, they start trying to jump into a genre or something like that instead of going for like, I don't know, picking a cool sound or like getting something that's inspiring to start with as opposed to trying to follow guidelines until it works. And my method to that has always been like I just hop on the piano and start yeah. fiddling around until I find a cool progression, and then whatever tempo I wrote it at, I'll apply it to, you know, I'll record it over that tempo, and then if I'm feeling like a tempo changes in order, then I'll change it. That could be like one twenty eight, mm-hmm. one thirty, you know, one hundred BPM, freaking one seventy five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it always starts in a similar way of inspiration on the piano. Yeah. And I think and that's different for everybody. And I think I think for the most part, everybody's going to have like that one thing that is going to be consistent enough to inspire them. And I think finding that is a real key. Like whatever you do to first open that DAW or whatever you do is going to be what's going to get you to be more productive. Because I think a lot of times Mm -hmm. with, you know people that are coming up and learning is that they're just too, they're thinking about too many different things at once. They're like, all right, well, after I do this, do I have art for it? And do I have, you know, like, how am I going to promote this? And it's like, man, just calm down. (laughs) Just, just, just write the song and then we'll worry about that. All right. Right. (laughs) It's funny. I had, and that's become like a problem for me. Like I'm thinking about, okay, where can I put this out? What mm-hmm. is going to be the art direction? What is going to be like the content that goes with it? Yeah. And it distracts me from the actual music. And it's something that I've been struggling with and I'm trying to work on even now. Yeah. And I think it's really difficult for you. And a similar thing to me, because I've always been interested in graphic design, is that, yeah. you know, and that feels like a part of a creative part to it, you know? Like that could Absolutely. be an inspiration, you know, having a cool, uh, you know, yeah. aesthetic that you're going for visually and then writing to that is a really cool thing. Right. You know? And I, I actually do approach a lot of my stuff like that. Like, uh, autonomous is one of the few EPs where I wrote, I made the art after mm-hmm. the music, but generally I'll start with the art and I'll go back and write the music to the art or do them side by side. Like I'll yeah. design the art and get this feel for like where I want the EP to go um, and then write the music around it. Like, if you listen to my older stuff, um, like, for example, Illuminate EP, which was, mm-hmm. like, my 2018, 17, 2017 EP, it's very, like, mysterious and, you know, darker than my mm-hmm. other stuff, and the art reflects that. And Or, like, my EP um, Immunity uh, is very, like, retro wave and, and the art reflects it. So, yeah. This upcoming EP I, I'm working on, uh, well, I don't know if it's an EP or larger body yet. But, yeah. Um, the thing that you're working the, on now. <laughs> sure. I'm doing the art first, or I'm doing the art alongside the music, and then Interesting. Um, I think that really helps to solidify the musical direction. Yeah, that's an interesting way to think of, uh, to work at my, it, too. My, yeah, my biggest inspiration, Porter Robinson, and I, I guess Maddie on now, too, is I can see, I can tell that that's how they approached writing worlds or adventure. Oh or yeah. Itself. The, the, the thing I really appreciate about them and the reason why they even like eclipse artists like Skrillex and dead mouse for me is because of their world building and their mm-hmm. ability to tie visuals, music and like storytelling together into a 
like a digestible package. Like when I watch a Porter show or like a, uh, you know, something like that, it's, it feels like I'm watching a movie more than it does going to a concert. That's yeah. the reason I really appreciate their stuff. And like they approach their album writing and stuff with such a distinctive art direction and story that um, it, it really does uh, add to the music. That's what I'm trying to approach in my stuff too. Yeah. And, um, no, cause I remember the first time the first Porter Robinson song I heard was the, uh, the knife party remix of Spitfire, I think. Nice. And then I was like, Oh, well this is, this is hot. Let me, uh, let me go check out the original. And when I listened to the original, it, it was so crazy because the difference of going from knife parties to Porter's tells a huge story about what electronic music was like back then too, because you had right. Porter who was this massively huge, like amazingly creative young, young lad. And right. he was writing this music that was so, it was so unique in the sense that electronic, a lot of the electronic music that was really popular around the time. Like Tristan was huge. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it had like all those types of music that felt more like it was telling a story were a lot more were becoming more prevalent, you know, and that was a really interesting yeah. turn because, you know, I remember listening to like like old dubstep from like 2009 and stuff like that. Yeah. And then it's like that stuff's cool. But you move from that to, you there know, there was no like there was no it was just music. Yeah. Um, and that was the thing that really changed my life. Um, and made me realize like the power of electronic music was, you know, world or yeah. adventure or language even like, or easy with Matt and Zoe. that mm -hmm. like that really opened my eyes to like, this could be more than just a compilation of bangers, which is like what I was used to with dead mouse. But right. I actually discovered Porter, I think on the, like the pre cycle for worlds, like I think Lionhearted had come out mm -hmm. and I heard Lionhearted, I heard easy. And then I heard language and I was instantly sold. And then worlds, yeah, language is an amazing track. <laughs> oh man. I still play language. God. Um, the, the, um, I, I remember I was so excited for worlds and it was like, it literally changed my life and perspective on music mm -hmm. um and that's so cliche because everybody says that about worlds but it right. really did for me influence like how i approached music i mean I it's only a, a cliche because of how powerful the work is you know yeah i, I actually wrote a um a full-length album in 2014 <laughs> uh a concept album or 2015 or whatever it was um and I never released it. I, I don't think it's good wow. enough to release, but but it was that inspiring to me where I was like, okay, now I need to do something. Like that. You ever think that's about releasing it though? <laughs> Not that work, but there's songs from it that have been released since. Like um, mm -hmm. there's a song called Navigate. Okay. Yeah. Which was on there. Um, there was a song called uh, Community, mm -hmm. which is now on the Illuminate EP. Um, there's a handful of other songs from it, but I don't think the body of work as a whole is good enough to release, but there were yeah. some really cool ideas there. Um, but could you say what the concept short, was? It was, um, God, what was it? You know, I, I genuinely don't remember. It was something, to but do you with remember time. it was awesome. <laughs> I mean, it was something to do with time. And like, if you went for if you went back in time, you could remember the future. What that that, that was that was like <laughs> the idea. Oh, that's whack! Crazy, right? Man, yeah. I I I, I should have. I don't know. If I put it out in 2014, it would have been acceptable. But now it's like <laughs> now it sounds too 2015, 14. It's it's yeah. not good. Like, well, it's just like not up to my standard anymore. And right, um, I'm working on better stuff now with a yeah. different theme. So I think it'll be good. On a similar note, um, I get a lot of people that come up to me. They'll send me their song, and they'll be like, "Do you think this sounds good enough to release?" 
And mm. I have a really... The way I approach that is yeah. the mix. Because you could have a... Yeah. You know, you could do so much in a song so long as your mix is good. If your mix is solid, you could do whatever the fuck you want. Like, right. you can... You can you can do all sorts of stuff as long as you know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Like, I 100 percent agree with that. Yeah, because you can have a stereo sub if you know how to treat it, like Matt Lang or something like that. And but- you have some crazy, like off the wall music that gets released and people really vibe with it. Yeah, um, it's it's yeah. To me, it's like if somebody asks you that, I'm like, do you think it's ready to release? Yeah, and then then like the follow up is like the mix and the master, but. Um, I feel like mm-hmm. that's secondary for for that. Like you can fix yeah. a mix, right? And I think- although in my own stuff, <laughs> I, I always I always try to I always try to treat mixing creatively too. Like Atlas oh, yeah. is a similar thing, but you know you can fix a bad mix if it comes to it. <laughs> yeah, and I think you know mixing to me is almost half of the creative process because to me mixing Agreed. is just the process of working with audio. You know. So right. whenever I'm working on things, you know, I try to I try to approach every song differently because I don't like to because mm-hmm. I just like to learn new things. So like one yeah. track that I did recently, I haven't even really named it. I just call it Piano Cuts. But what I did was I'm not a pianist at all. OK, but okay. I fiddled around, you know, throughout my times. So I went to my keyboard and I just recorded myself playing on the keys for like, I don't know, six minutes or something like that, unedited. Yeah. And I just uploaded those and I called them, you know, ad libs. And I just kept them there. Mm-hmm. But then what I did is I just took those recordings and then cut out like the main melodic lines and the chords and I, you know, started to cut them around and just do like different things with it. And yeah. the coolest thing about that process when it comes to mi- mixing is that when you approach your song in a more creative sense, you learn a lot more about mixing, I think, because different types of music gets mixed, gets mixed all sorts of different ways. I definitely learned to mix by writing hip hop. Yeah. Um, And this was like 2015 Mm -hmm. had to have been, and I've been writing music for 12 years. So (laughs) it was very late. um, (laughs) Just listening to other genres of music, I realized like, Oh, that makes sense. This is why you mix it like that. Right. And that's um, the biggest part. Why you mix it like yeah. that. Cause you have a lot of EDM people right. that are like, Oh, but throw a side chain on there. I'm like, all right, well, do you it's know like why you're why. playing the side chain there? Like, do you, right. do you know why, you know? Cause right. Like, exactly. I, I side chain like maybe like 10 or 15 different ways. And it all depends, you know, like sometimes sure. I'll uh, just side chain the subs. So like if I have, you know, yeah. like the kick, and the sub, and then that's the only thing that's getting um, side-chained because it's just, I want to keep, like, the transients of the weird rhythms and stuff that are in there, so I don't want to duck everything, you know? Um, And it works really well with things that are more fast and complicated or dense, like drum and bass or things like that. But then when you have um, people that come in and they just... I don't know. They just kind of do things because they know that's the way that you do them. You know, like I tried to work on mixing things outside of electronic music just to see what you're supposed to do. Like, how do you mix a metal track? Like, how how do you work with guitars? I have the most fun doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I work on a a lot of stuff outside of electronic music. Um, I've mixed like, you know, pop records, country records, rock mm-hmm. records. I've done a J pop record, which was amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, that was the, my favorite one ever. Um, I think, yeah, I learned, a, you learn a lot when you get out of your bubble. Yeah. And I think particularly, I mean, for electronic artists, you know, pretty much the biggest difference is how you treat the low end. I think because like if you're mixing yeah, sub is pretty unique to electronic music. It really is. And I think a lot of people yeah. can't get past that in their mind. Like whenever mm-hmm. I had a buddy who's only ever done electronic music and he was sending me a rough mix he was doing for a buddy of his that was doing mm-hmm. a jazz record. And 
he sent it to me, but he was making the kick like way too loud. Thick. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. listen, in jazz, that kick's supposed to be like way back there. Your rhythm comes from like your your bass, you know, and things like that. And then the the kick and the snares and the hats and all that kind of stuff is just there for rhythm, more or less. And then, you know, but if you're in the electronic music mindset, you're just thinking like, just make bass loud and it'll be great, you know? Right. That was a big thing that I had to get over in my mind once I started working on other people's stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing when you're working on your own, but whatever. Yeah, it's for me, it's always just trying to imitate the genre. Yeah. Like, I need to go in and listen to 10 songs of the genre so I can really get an understanding of, okay, this is what they like in this genre. Yeah. Um, and this is how I can approach it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then also, like, you're, you're, you're obviously getting hired for your tone. Like, people mm-hmm. hire you because of your, I guess, not your skill, but your, um, your approach. Right. Um, and they they expect that from your mixing, at, at least like at higher level mixing. Like right. when you get hired at a low level, some people are just like, oh, I wanted to sound good. But when you get to a certain level where you're charging like thousands of dollars for mix, it's like I'm hiring you because I like the work that you do in this style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So I think it is important to always put your own fingerprint on it anyway. But yeah. And, you know, I've always that's kind of inevitable, I think. <laughs> You think so? I think so. Like your workflow is your fingerprint. Mm -hmm. Um, The way you set things, the way the order you put your plugins in, like the subconscious things that you do really define your tone. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, I think that's really important, too, because I'm the type of guy that I like to have the sound like if I'm making like a a bass or a pluck or whatever. I like to have ninety yeah. percent of the sound made in the synth before I start mm-hmm. doing post processing. Um, sure, <clears throat> at least for the main Same. stuff. At least for the That's main stuff, because like it's a lot easier now because you know we have awesome synths now, like Serum and right, you know Serum and <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, but I think too. That there's the opposite is a hard one to work with, too, because then you have people that are so finicky about making sure that they have the perfect whatever sample or the perfect patch yeah. to work with. And they don't think of how, you know, their the process can change the sound completely. Um, right. In particular, like recently I've been working on like making drums, like synthesizing drums and stuff like that. <laughs> So I've been watching a lot of Mr. Bill tutorials because I love his drums sure. and he makes yeah. them himself. So I'm like, how does he make them? Because I want to make that. And it's all built from really simple parts. You know, it's just a couple right. of sign oscillators and some noise. The rest of it, like the actual like changing of the timbres and stuff in the snare is like the, the post-processing that's added to it. Like the reverb and, you know, the particular types of distortion, things like that. Um, right. So I think a lot of really cool stuff can be built from really simple parts, but people are really quick to try to make a complicated answer to a simple problem. I think. Yeah. that's something I've really picked up on over the past few years is like Mm -hmm. the simpler you can get your stuff, the better. Yeah. At least in my opinion and in the genre I write like, or in the style I write, I guess, um, the 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 easier it is, the better. Yeah. Like the less complicated it is, the better the end result will be. Mm-hmm. At least for like you know what I. Yeah. <laughs> I think in general too, like even if you're doing really complicated stuff, the faster you can get to that point, the better. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Because yeah. what ends up happening, to me at least, if I sit there and just. Because I used to, I used to spend a lot of time in my projects. Like on average, each track I'd probably spend somewhere between forty and sixty hours on each one, and just yeah. it would just be tweaking little things. Like the track would pretty much be written in the first, you know, three or four hours, but it's all the the little tweaking and stuff that I'd get sure, caught up doing. Yeah. 
And a lot of times you end up doing what we said earlier, like just adding and adding and then taking away, taking away. And then by the time you've worked 40, 60, 70 hours on something, it's a completely different track. Yeah, yeah. I want to show you something. I'm sorry, one second. So What's I up, bud? I have a at the store, and I can print ink. Oh, wow, that's pretty rad. Mm-hmm. I can print things in it. It's super bouncy when you form a ball, and it's very stretchy. Oh, that's awesome, bud. Sorry, that's my little brother. He's showing me some printed that's awesome. thing he got. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, and um, I don't, don't want to hold you too long. I don't want to. Yeah, you have any, like, uh, like last few questions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one thing I wanted to ask is, um, <clears throat> sorry, getting over a cold here. Um, yeah, no worries. I wanted to ask some things that are maybe diverge a little bit from music because okay. um, I think those are interesting questions. Um, sort of in the same realm is do you have any particular soundtracks or anything that you go back to listening to? Oh, of course. Um, a lot of them are games. Uh, yeah. there's man, I love so many soundtracks. It's like hard to <laughs> narrow down because it's, it's difficult because I really enjoy like musicals of like the, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, Mm -hmm. but I also really like, you know, like modern soundtracks, and I also really like like traditional soundtracks, like John Williams and stuff. Yeah. Um, If I pick one of each, it'd be like, I really like the sound of music. I like uh, singing in the rain Mm -hmm. back in the day. That's more like show tune stuff. I I really enjoy like uh, Star Wars, obviously. Oh yeah, the soundtrack from that. Pretty much anything John Williams touches is gold. <laughs> uh, he's he's he like is a saint. He's the, he has well, a the thing about touch. It is he's the king of a very recognizable melodies and score, which is like yeah. a certain way of approaching score. Um, mm-hmm. It only works for some things. Uh, it works really well for character films, like like let's say Harry Potter or right. like Superman or Star Wars, but it wouldn't work for something. Like um, Inception, for example. My other right. favorite composer is Hans Zimmer. Yes. Uh, and he's the king of the opposite, which is like filling the void, but not making the score prevalent. He wants right. to hide it. He wants it to be in the background, setting the tone and not actually be in your face. Whereas John Williams has the opposite approach. Mm-hmm. I really like Inception. I really like uh, Interstellar. I love. Um... Oh, man. This, it's it's really tough. Tron Legacy is great. Oh yes, oh yeah. Uh, that's that's Daft Punk and mm-hmm. Hans Zimmer. Um, really incredible score that one. Uh, games I really like the Vanishing of Ethan Carter. It's amazing. Oh, I'm not Legends. familiar with that. Oh, if you're into stories, like really profound stories, um, and if you're into like those kind of story based games like the walking dead or those sort of games. That's a must play. Oh man. Uh, the, the vanishing of Ethan Carter. Um, one of the best scores I've ever heard in a game. Uh, I really that's like some Assassin's tall, Creed. that's some tall talk right there. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a hundred percent serious. Um, <laughs> Assassin's Creed series, uh, legend of Zelda, obviously every single oh, yeah. thing. Koji Kondo touches basically man. legend of Zelda, Mario Metroid. Mm-hmm. Um, He's actually my favorite composer of all time. Koji Kondo? I, yeah, I, I aspire to be him. Oh, uh, man. <laughs> like, if I could write The Legend of Zelda, I would be um, <laughs> A happy that boy. Would be my, <laughs> that would be my... That's my dream project, is working for Nintendo. Oh, um, wow. That's a... That's yeah, a... It, it's always been a goal, uh, but I don't think it's ever going to happen because I'm not Japanese. Well, I am Japanese, but I don't live in Japan. Um. Oh man, yeah. Those are those are some of the main ones. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> there's the, just there's so many. I I I couldn't even <laughs> couldn't even all the Disney movies. Yeah. Oh yeah, Disney Disney has always been amazing with their music. Even recently, like 
you know, even with, you know, like Frozen and stuff, not to be, you know, fucking yeah, whatever. No, but like, the fr- I, like, I went into Frozen, the first Frozen, just thinking, you know, yeah. all right, whatever, going to go see a Disney movie with the kids. I adored it. And then I walk out, like, move kids, get me, get me, <laughs> get me to the concession stand to buy some merch because 500%. I love that movie. Yeah. I love Disney that movie in so general much. is just magical. I, if, if you have Disney Plus, I would Oh, you dude, to watch. yes. Um, I implore you to watch. The Imagineering Story, really good documentary huh. about Walt Disney and the Imagineers designing Disneyland. Oh, wow. But it also has a lot of, like, insight on, like, the olden days of Disney. It's oh, really that's cool. awesome. What was it called? The Imagineers? Imagineering Story. Oh, Imagineering Story. Yeah, I'm going to have to yeah. watch that now because I find that yeah. stuff really fascinating. Me too. Because, like, uh, like the, the soundtracks and stuff I end up listening to a lot, they're very similar. They're... A lot of them are video games. Like I listen to the near yeah. near automata and replicant soundtracks. Amazing. A lot. Oh, I, I forgot to mention anime music. Like oh yeah. Literally so much. All of Studio Ghibli. Oh yeah. Like, Joe uh was it? Anything Sashi. from Shinkai too. Like mm. like your name, uh, Garden of Words. Yes. I end up listening to Shiki a lot. Yeah. Shiki's soundtrack is a really amazing. Um, but like, listen to Princess Lava. Mononoke. Is oh, like that's that's my favorite Ghibli movie. That that yeah. Oh man, but man, or, or Spirited Away has a great soundtrack too. It does. I've just watched Spirited yeah. Away like a billion times now. So I'm just, yeah. I'm just like, yeah. I need to give this like a five year break. I, I think a really underrated it. one from Ghibli is, is uh, Kiki's Delivery. Yes, it's thank you. Soundtrack. I've been telling everybody that. I'm like, man, y'all, y'all talking about Ghibli movies, but you're not talking about Ki- Kiki's Delivery Service. That's <laughs> it's so fun. It's such a fun movie. Yeah, it's really good. And soundtrack just captures it all. And perfectly. I think, I think, back to earlier, I think my melodic writing is so influenced by games and Studio Ghibli music. Yeah, like. That and like the Beatles, you know, it's like, <laughs> like very like catchy. This is like obviously like the melody kind of music. Yeah. Legend of Zelda, too. Oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. But uh, I think that's pretty much all I have for you at the moment. But I'm, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. This is awesome. Absolutely. It's really fun. Very inspiring and very, very nice to actually talk with people that are inclined to In the same music. things. Yeah. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. But, uh, I'll it's let always you... enjoyable. Oh yeah. yeah. That's a big thing when we had the discord too, is just finding people to talk about music yeah. stuff and they understand it. <laughs> but, uh, all right, I'll let you get on your way, but thanks again, Julian, for, for popping Absolutely, by man. It's- Great talking to you. Yeah, man. We'll have to maybe do it again sometime in the late future. Cool. 